Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to the first day of Winter Equip. Did it feel like it out there? Yeah, it did, didn't it? I, I have good news. 62 days till spring. That just doesn't sound like that long, but I'm ready for it. <laughs> if we haven't met yet, I'm Pam Ellis. I've been worshiping and serving here at Harvest since the very first service. I've loved seeing the work that God has done in us and through us, both corporately as a church and personally in my life. And I'll tell you that some of it has been over the moon fun. I mean like a blast. I just love seeing what God has done and is doing. But some of it honestly has been gut-wrenchingly difficult. There are some hard things in life. But in both of those situations, I have seen God his holy, redemptive joy because of Jesus. Who he is and what he does as he fulfills his perfect plan in us at this time for his glory. He is our joy. I'll introduce you to my family here. Oh, did it change? There it goes. Yeah, this is my family. Aren't they cute? I absolutely love them. You might recognize a few faces. They also attend and uh, serve at Harvest. The ones that you don't recognize live on the other side of town, and they serve Jesus in another really good church. If you notice, there's eight amazing grandkids in that picture. And I'll likely be sharing some stories about those grandkids because those little people, they're the ones who teach me the big lessons, the hard lessons. Matter of fact, I'll share one right now, just because I told you I would. So, family Christmas time. Do you have a lot of people at your house that open gifts around Christmas? With those eight grandchildren, for many years now, the moms and dads have been teaching the kids, when you open a gift, be sure you say thank you, even if it sucks. <laughs> right? And they've worked on this, and they've worked on this, and. And this year, one of the fun stories was uh, one of the moms had her kids practice the words they would use if they opened a package and it wasn't something cool or something that they wanted, you know, if it was socks. And so they used practice words and they tried. And mom taught them, when you're given a gift, somebody thought of you. They did something good for you. They thought you needed it or wanted it or would love it and they gave you that gift and wrapped it up and handed it to you because they loved you so it's important that you be grateful for the gift even if it sucks so they practiced their words and they practiced their words and all the kids got together at uh, my son and daughter-in-law's house and they opened their gifts and they all said thank you thank you oh this is wonderful and there were some socks and uh, Later on, that mom was talking to, to their children, and they said, well, what did you think about the gifts this year? And this child said, I didn't have to use any of my practice words. I loved everything. It was wonderful. Now, ladies, I was there. Everything was not wonderful. It was very average on some of the things. But because they had been taught and prepared, and they understood that the people giving them gifts did it because they loved them, and they picked it out for them. They were thankful for those gifts. Isn't that a good lesson? I think we can all take that and apply it to our lives. So I hope you had a wonderful time celebrating Jesus with your family at Christmas, and I hope his presence and leading is with you in the new year. I love this winter equipped season. After that busyness of the holiday time, it's really nice to look forward to winter equip. It is so gray and cold and blah in January, February, March. Ugh. It helps me to know that when I get up in the morning, I'm going to go sit with God, I'm going to study his word, and there are going to be other women, that's you guys, who are getting up and studying their word, and we're doing it for ourselves, but also so that we can come together and we can share with each other and encourage each other, and we all get to know Jesus better. We walk together in this slow season, 
it makes it so much warmer when we walk in his light together. It's, it's really better than any sun lamp. It really is. And we can be thankful for the gifts that God gives us, just like my little grandchild. Let's take care of a few housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, uh, your books. Everybody have your books? First thing I want you to do is open it up and put your name in it because they all look the same and everybody sets it down and walks away. I don't know how many times I've sat it down, walked away, and then thought, where'd I leave it? And somebody will call and say, we have your book. <laughs> That's where it is. <laughs> so put your name in your book. Um, we're going to follow the Carmel School District's uh, weather delay. So if you hear that Carmel Schools is canceled because of more snow, are we going to get more snow? Or cold weather or anything like that, we will not meet. But everybody that is on staff or teaching is going to try their best to be here and we'll go ahead and video the lesson so you can follow it online. And uh, Laura sent out the, the email that told about where you could find the link. Um, there's a little change to that. The link is the same, but to, the session will not be uploaded until Thursday. So it'll be a little bit of a delay if we have a school delay. I'm just hoping that if we snow delay, it's for real snow and not for 35 <laughs> below. I can handle the snow. Um, the other thing I want to tell us about is if we have children in the nursery, we want to be sure that we finish our discussion by 11 o'clock so that we pick them up. Because those sweet ladies, they, and there may be some gentlemen over there too, they are working hard to take care of your kids and we want to be sure that we respect them by getting there and picking the kids up on time so that they don't want to quit. We don't want them to quit. <laughs> so we'll do that. Um, and then we have an upcoming marriage conference that I want to tell you about. Uh, it's in, on February 24th. It's from 8 in the morning until 3.30 in the afternoon. You get breakfast and lunch and it will be really great. And I want to really encourage you to sign up if you're married and go to this marriage uh, conference. It will be really, really good. I love marriage conferences. I, my husband and I were married for 43 years before my husband went to heaven and we went to every marriage conference that every church we ever went to put on. It was so much fun. We met some of our best friends there and we just had a wonderful time and it was a real blessing. So I just want to encourage you, sign up and you have a few more days, I think till January 21st, you can get the, uh, the early bird discount. So save a little money and then you can go out to eat. Okay, so let's chat a bit about navigating this study. How many of you have done a study here at Harvest before? Okay, great, great. So it all might be repeat information for you, but I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> so um, nobody's gonna check your book work, nobody. But please do your homework because that's how you get the good out of the study. If you don't do it, you miss it. So we want you to do it. But don't worry if you don't get it done because everybody's weeks fall apart from time to time. So there's grace here. There is grace for homework not done. I wish my school teachers had known that. But while there's grace, there's also encouragement to press on. So we are going to try to spur you on to love and good works. Every teacher and writer has their own voice that they communicate with, the way they communicate. And it might take just a minute as you read it uh, to catch on to their style. But don't let it keep you from pressing on in God's word. Ladies, look at these two books. These are not the same. They don't look the same, they're not the same. This is the effort of women who are very knowledgeable and have done the very best that they can to help us learn more about this word. But this is the one that is life-changing. This is the one that comes from God himself. And this is where we wanna focus our attention no matter what study we, we're doing. So keep that in mind. Um, when you read a study and you're learning the language of the teacher. I want you to think about it this way. Think about sitting with uh, a, new, a new study buddy, a new friend who has a marked 
accent or dialect. And you have to kind of listen closely and lean in sometimes to understand what they're saying and how they say it. What's your favorite accent? Mine is Irish. I love an Irish accent. I could listen to the phone book read with an Irish accent. You know, but then there are other accents that I really like, but I just have to listen really, really closely. My parents uh, both had parents who were German. And boy, you had to listen closely to Grandma to figure out what she was saying. But once you got it figured out, you knew. And sometimes you pick up those same phrases. So remember that when you're doing a Bible study as well, because it works that way also. Now, the other thing about a study in church is that every church that I have been a part of, there have been three comments that are made about the study, specifically about the questions. Someone will say, these questions are too easy. Who wrote these? Did they think we were five? Well, and someone will say, these questions are too hard. My brain doesn't work like this. I'm not smart enough to do this study. I'll just quit. Don't do it. And then someone will say, these questions are not clear. I have no idea what this author is asking. I just don't get it. What did they mean? So let's just stop right now and let's just decide when we have these questions. And we will, because I do. I, I ask these questions about questions that are in studies. Uh, let's decide we're going to handle them all the same way, okay? We're going to humble ourselves. We're going to humble our hearts, and we're going to go to God, and we're going to ask him to help us, to help us to learn and to understand and show us how to navigate this. And after we've done that, we're going to take that question that we didn't like for whatever reason, and we're going to set it aside. And we're going to go to God's word, to the text of Scripture, that was referred to in the question, and we're going to read that. And we're going to read it again, and we're going to read it again until we understand that a little bit. And I guarantee you, you'll, you'll learn from God's word, even if you don't understand the question in the study. By pressing into God's word, that's where you're going to get your important lessons. So a blank answer is okay, and I would even suggest that if you have a blank that you don't know how to fill in, I'd like you to write in that blank, I didn't get this question. You can even say, this question was dumb. But when I read the verse, this is what I saw. And then write what you saw when you read the scripture. You'll get so much more out of it. You really, really will. Okay. Let's see. This particular study uses a method called OIA. It's a great tool to use to study God's word. Um, I find it especially helpful because it doesn't take a lot of tools. You don't have to have a full set of markers or any kind of degree or resource material or anything. It's very simple. All you need is the Holy Spirit, the word, and yourself. That's it. And the most important part of that is the Holy Spirit. And we always start every study when we sit down with it with prayer. We begin by asking God, the Holy Spirit, to teach us. And we're so blessed because we're talking to the author. So there's not going to be any miscommunication. He's going to talk to us just the way we should, just the way we need it. So we're going to ask God first. In my book, I'll show you, uh, she often, in this study, I like this, she uh, mentions on the days to pray. And I actually took a green highlighter, and I highlighted all the times she says, before you begin, pray and ask God. And I did that because that's my problem. I get up and I dive in. I'm very task-oriented. I make the lists. I cross off the things. I'm, I'm like running to the victory line. Yay, I got it done. It's noon, and I got all my lists completed. But in Bible study, that's not a good way to be. You need to take the time and listen to God. So I highlight it just to remind myself so that I stop and I pray before I jump in. Uh, because learning the things of God are best not rushed. Take your time. Take your time. Okay, so here is OIA. Let's just break it down just a little bit. Uh, o is for observation. We're going to read the text, and we're going to ask, what does it say? Really simple. 
What does it say? We're going to ask who, what, where, when, how, all of those questions, but we're especially going to notice what does this say about God. And then we're going to go to I, which is interpretation. We're going to read the text, and we're going to ask, what does it mean? Why is it here? What are the details? And then the A is for application. We're going to read the text, and we're going to ask, how does this transform me? How does it inform my life? Is there a promise to claim, a command to obey? Is there an action to take? a praise to be offered, a sin to turn from. So the way we'll use this book, the way it's used in this book is found on page 8. If you want to open and kind of take a sneak peek on page 8, she describes it really well. Each day is dedicated to one part of OIA, and you'll notice there's two days of I, so we get a little bit of time in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's really good. Um, And then on the fifth day, we reflect on what we've learned. And we get so much out of that. So it's, it's going to be fun. It really is. So let's pray and get started. Jesus, I just ask that you would be with us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would teach us, that you would keep all of us out of the way, and that we would just hear from you. I pray, Father, we would honor you with our conversation, with our, with our, our prayer, and with our reading Be glorified in this, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's get started. This study, we're going to trace the joy of our salvation in Jesus from Genesis 3.15 by looking at seven familiar Old Testament stories. Now, I'm going to give you just a word of caution here. These stories are very familiar to you. When stories are familiar, it's really easy to think you know it all. Oh, I know that story. So I'm going to tell you, read it slowly and carefully and try very hard to read it with fresh eyes. Pretend that you never heard the story before. Put yourself in the place of someone who's never heard it and read it slowly so that you get to, uh, to have the whole package of God's great gracious gift. So here's our main idea. To live in the joy of God's great salvation, we must remember and obey his word clearly, correctly, and completely, and obey him courageously. I do like alliteration. So, take out your Bibles, and let's go to Genesis 1. Now, you did not have to read Genesis 1. Genesis 1 is the story of creation. You probably learned it in Sunday school or maybe in a little golden book that children read. It's very familiar to you. That chapter one is the happening. It's the big event. But when we get to chapter two, where we were to start reading for this week, it's the unfolding of the happening. We get all the details. And this is where we read and we listen carefully to move past things that are familiar. This is where we move past common cultural assumptions about Bible stories. This is where we move past the embellished children's stories. This is where we get to the holy reality. And as we read the text, I want you to notice the beautiful simplicity of the story. God created everything. It was all his. It was good. And he had authority over all of it. In chapter 2, verse 7, we'll start reading there. Then the Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge and good and evil. In verses 10 through 14, the details of the water supply, the precious gold and stones are noted, and you get an idea of the vastness and the diversity of God's creation. In verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Man was created and designed for God's purpose. And isn't this neat? This shows work as God's calling. This is before sin entered the world. 
Work is not punishment. It's a divine purpose and a privilege. But just imagine, God put Adam in the most beautiful garden that he designed himself. It had to be awesome. And as of yet in creation, there were no thorns and no weeds. That's the kind of garden I want, because my garden is usually thorns and weeds, with an occasional tomato that I didn't plant. <laughs> Adam wasn't working against anything, but he was working for the care of God's creation, God's garden. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now just a couple things to note here. God gave Adam full access to all the good fruit, all of it. Delicious variety, easy picking. He didn't have any lack. There was no reason for Adam to go after anything else. And the second thing we want to note is that God was clear about what tree was off limits and the consequences that would come if they ate of it. So our first note is to live in the joy of our salvation, we must remember clearly. There was no doubt about God's command, no vagueness, no hidden agenda. It was straightforward truth from the one with full authority to give it. There was also nothing man-made to distract Adam from hearing or obeying God. There was no reason to sin. Can you imagine having no distractions from God in your life? I mean, I have a hard time just remembering that I need to shut off my device and go fix dinner. Anybody else? Or not take my phone with me while I'm fixing dinner. But Adam had none of that. Verse 18, then the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make a helper fit for him. Then God showed Adam all the animals and the birds, and he lets Adam name them. And when he named them, it was clear that there was not a helper fit for him among them. Now, this is one story in scripture that I have always had a little movie of in my head. I have always imagined Adam and God standing there and God saying, start the parade and all of the animals coming before Adam, and Adam giving them names. And I can just imagine him saying, oh, you're a penguin, yep. And you're a flamingo, <laughs> you're an elephant. <laughs> but he saw all of the animals and he named them all. What a huge job, what a fun job, right? But in doing all that, in seeing every animal that there was that God created, there was no one that was fit to help Adam. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Man clearly recognized woman as his God-given helper. Therefore, a man shall leave his mother and father and hold fast to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. And once again, God is clear about his design. One man with one wife becoming one flesh for God's purpose. To live in the joy, we must remember clearly. We also must remember correctly and completely. Let's look at that. When we think about remembering correctly and completely, that, that means that we don't add to scripture. Deuteronomy 12.32 says, everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take away from it. So now let's look at 3.1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God has, had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the trees 
the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Did she add to it? So when I was studying for this, I ran across an old rabbi's tale that illustrated this scripture. It's a tale. It's not in the scriptures. So we don't, it, we don't look at it as truth, but it's a cool story, so I'm going to tell it to you. This rabbi said, when the, when the serpent came to Eve and said, did God surely say? And she said, oh, not only can we not eat, we can't even touch it. The serpent stepped forward and pushed Eve up against the tree. And then he reached down and helped her get off, up off the ground, and he said, you won't surely die. It's just a story. That's not truth. But it certainly illustrates how we sometimes fall into Satan's plans because we add to what God's word said, and it opens a door and makes a place for the devil. Let's go back to um, Genesis 128, just real quick. Just turn back there and look. It says, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Do you see the failure to remember correctly? The first thing the woman forgot was that serpent, crafty, sparkly, slick talker that he was, was a created beast. He was a beast of the field. He was below mankind in God's creation. Man was to have dominion over him. But she listened to him. In the New Testament, we're told to give no place to the devil. Ephesians 4.27 tells us, do not give the devil an opportunity. But just fudging a little bit on those two points, remembering completely and remembering correctly, opened the door. Remember, don't surrender your God-appointed role to anyone or anything. It belongs to God completely. Don't forget what God has designed you to do, what he commanded you to do, and do it correctly. When you read this familiar text, did you notice that the serpent talked to Eve about what God said, but that it was Adam that God spoke to about the tree first? That was back in 2.16 and 17. Eve had not been created yet. But let's give Adam a little credit here. Let's assume that he likely told Eve about what God said. But she was vulnerable to the serpent because it appears that she didn't hear it from God herself. So I want you to remember, it is important that we know God's word firsthand. Hide it in your heart. That means memorize it. Run every question you have, whether it's small or whether it's large, through the truth of scripture. We live in such a time of blessing. We have available to us podcasts and books and resources and YouTube channels, and we can listen to church services all across the nation, all across the world. But ladies, they are no substitute for God's word. You will never remember clearly what you have not learned for yourself from God. I'm going to say that again. You will not remember clearly what you have never learned for yourself from God. But let's read on because there's more. Verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. I hadn't seen that before. Then the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loincloths. Did you see that? The serpent's whole deception strategy was to get Eve to question the clarity of God's <coughs> word, to question the correctness and the completeness of God's word. And so 
to doubt God himself. The serpent got Eve to think that she could be like God with just a piece of fruit. That's just, that's just heavy. You can almost feel it, can't you? You know what? The delivery method of Satan is still the same today. He tells us, think of yourself. Did God really say that? And his plans are the same. Doubt God's clear word, put yourself on the throne, and die. That is the goal of Satan. Die. Don't live. Consider when we look at this story, God is all about life, abundant life, purposeful life, that brings him glory. Don't you just want to scream, no, when he talks to the serpent? Don't talk to him. He's a bad guy. Why are you talking to him? Talk to God. Talk to God. Ask him your questions. Talk to your creator. It's kind of amazing when you think God was physically available to Adam and Eve. He walked with them in the garden. So remember clearly, remember completely and correctly, and finally, remember courageously. Let's read on. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Why are you here? Or where are you? Sorry, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. What makes you hide from God? The Bible tells us that we all sin in many ways. Romans 3, 9 and 10, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This hiding here is the result of knowing good from evil. They knew they had sinned. And they must have remembered God's clear word as soon as they realized they were naked and their eyes were open. I wonder if they hid fearing immediate death. I don't know. But I do know they responded courageously. Does that sound funny? Verse 11, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you gave me to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. One commentator pointed out that Adam and Eve were standing there when the serpent went from whatever form he was in to being a belly crawler. Can you imagine seeing that? Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. When faced with their sin, Adam and Eve told what they did. They confessed. Yes, there was some blame passing. There was. Sometimes we look at that and we don't look at the rest. They each took ownership for their own appetite that led to sin. And it revealed the true instigator of their fall, the serpent. Verse 15 is often pointed to as the first prophecy of Jesus our Savior. The offspring of the woman bruising the head of the serpent, and this is indeed true. But the entire gospel is here in this story. God made everything perfectly. God met with the man personally. God blessed abundantly. God communicated clearly. But man on his own did not remain faithful. And there were just two trees that he couldn't have. And those two trees identified the fact that God was above man. Some things are for God alone and not for man. And man got in trouble when he tried to be like God. Man 
is going to need a savior. And God knew. And he himself would send Jesus. So how does this apply to us? How can this familiar story transform us? And how does this give us joy? We, like Adam and Eve, are prone to forget who made us. Who provides everything we need for life and godliness. That's 2 Peter 1, 3. We forget who has given us purpose and what that purpose is. We forget that he alone is God and we are not. We simply forget to remember him. We don't remember him clearly, correctly, completely. And when we forget to live courageously in light of who he is, confessing our sin and obeying him, even when the sparkly, slick-talking serpent around us appeal to our human appetites. So as we study the seven Old Testament stories of salvation, remember that they all courageously served to get us to Jesus the Messiah, who bruised the head of the serpent and saves us from eternal death by bearing our sin and overcoming death, hell, and the grave for us because he loves us. The length that God has gone to to save us is worth remembering. And when we remember that, we have great joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just sit with us and teach us. Remind us of who you are. Help us to know you clearly, completely, and correctly. And to live our lives courageously for you. Guide our discussions now and our prayer time. Unite us as table groups and help us to bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. I have just a few instructions for you. So if you 